you very much for inviting me again. And as you rightly said, I sort of have two areas of work. One is about war and conflict and security policies, and the other is about civil society and social movements. I, I was going to start with a point. Uh, there's a very nice book by Ulrich Beck that has just come out called German Europe. And in the book, he says... Uh, monetary union without political union wasn't a mistake. Now everybody is saying we should never have established a monetary union without a political union. It was deliberate. The idea was to create material interests in political cooperation. And I think that's actually a very important point because, you know, maybe if we do have a hope, it's people being very scared about what would happen if monetary union collapsed. Um, it was, if you like, according to him, an extension of the Monet method. And the Monet method, as many of you will remember, was we're going to create Europe by economic cooperation of various kinds, steel, coal, agriculture, and eventually the politics will follow. And it was based on the assumption of what was known at the time as the permissive consensus, namely that we trusted our elites and they could go ahead and do what they liked. And actually, politics was really neglected. And that, I think, is the problem today, that p the permissive consensus is evaporating. And uh, the question is, is actually, are the material interests in political cooperation strong enough to preserve and extend the European Union? What I want to talk today about is some research that we undertook at my unit last year, and the aim was to try and uncover a new political basis for uh, European Union. Um, and, well, I mean, in a minute I'll tell you what, I, what we concluded, but then I want to reflect a little about the problems of political legitimacy uh, and the ways in which we maybe do need to reconceptualise Europe if we have, are to have a hope of generating a new uh, political basis for the European Union. So we called the study subterranean politics and um, we used the term because we weren't quite sure what we were looking for. <laughs> and we used the term to refer to a range of new and interesting phenomena outside the political mainstream. And I didn't want to use the term civil society, partly because people tend to associate civil society with NGOs. And we tended to think about NGOs, and I'll come back to that later, as actually part of the elite, as institutionalized <laughs> politics. But also we wanted to be able to include new political parties, which are usually considered outside of civil society, like the Pirate Party, like the Five Star Movement in Italy. Uh, and we didn't want to use the term social movements, also because we wanted to look at political parties, but also because there's such a big scholarly literature about social movements and civil society that there are, there's a whole theoretical apparatus about how you go about studying these phenomena, and we wanted, in a way, to start afresh. So what we did was we had seven field teams across Europe uh, looking at the emergence of subterranean politics in different cultural contexts. And we had four country teams looking at Germany, Spain, Italy, and, and Hungary. We had one global city, which was London. Actually, we started off with a UK study, and then we realized London was so different from the rest of the UK that we decided it was going to be a city study. And we had two trans-European studies one looking at grassroots activism, the other looking, focusing on movements against austerity. So what I'm going to tell you really is what came out of those studies. And I just want to really make five points and then I'll come back to the issues of political legitimacy. The first point, which our chair mentioned, was bubbling up or resonance also. Actually, what we observed in Europe was not necessarily bigger or more extensive or more organised or more transnational than in the past. I mean, I've been running this 
Global Civil Society program at LSE, and we've tracked things like the movement against the war in Iraq, climate change, the World Social Forum, and in many ways they were just as big. But what was interesting about the events of 2012 was the way they hit the mainstream. <laughs> and I'll just give you a few little examples of that. One is that in Germany, for example, those people who were protesting were known as Wutberger, angry citizens. Mm -hmm. But actually, it wasn't a term invented by the people themselves. It was invented by the press. And Wutberger became the new word of the year in the official German language uh, society, the Gesellschaft für die Deutsche Sprache. Uh, <coughs> similarly, Indignados, which was the name given to the Spanish protesters, was not invented by the Spanish protesters. They called themselves the 15th of May movement. It was invented by the press explicitly referring, and some of you maybe have read this because it's really wonderful, a pamphlet by Stefan Hessel, who was a French World War II resistance hero, also one of the drafters of the Declaration of Human Rights in his 90s, who wrote a passionate pamphlet called En Dignez-vous, Be Indignant. It's actually translated into English as Time for Outrage, but I, I think it sounds better in En Dignez-vous. And so the press called them Indignados, the people who got indignant, which was actually an invented noun, apparently. <laughs> So that's one example. The other example I was going to give you was Occupy in London. Actually, it was quite small. It was about 100 people, and most of them had either been in climate change camps, as we discovered when we interviewed them, or they'd been <coughs> sitting outside Parliament Square for 10 years protesting against the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Some of you may remember that you saw them when you went, but nobody took any notice of them at all. <laughs> But when they moved into the square mile and set up camp, suddenly they became a focus of mainstream interest. They caused a crisis in the Church of England, which could not be a more establishment organisation, with no less than three officials, I think, resigning, because there was an argument about whether they should be allowed to stay or not. Uh, bankers passed by and gave them money, and even, which most activists wouldn't even dream of, they got invited to write an article in the Financial Times. <laughs> so this is to give you... A, so what I really think is the first point I really wanted to stress, and of course it's reflected in the ri also the rise of new parties, political parties, like the Pirate Party in Germany, the Five Star Movement in Italy, is that what was really significant was the way it was bubbling up, the way it resonated. I have no idea whether it's bigger or lesser, but people took it seriously in a way they hadn't before. The second point I wanted to make is that these demonstrations were all about politics. They're often treated as demonstrations against austerity, but they were fundamentally all about politics, and that was true of absolutely everybody we interviewed. And perhaps the best proof of that is the fact that so much was going on in Germany, which wasn't suffering from austerity policies. And yet they had the demonstrations against the infrastructure projects in Frankfurt and Stuttgart. They had a march against the European Central Bank. They had uh, activists anonymous. They had a whole range of campaigns which we found in our German study. And, of course, they had the Pirate Party. Also, if you look at the slogans, so the Spanish slogans were things like a caro in every neighbourhood. <laughs> they think this is democracy, but it isn't. They, they were all very political. Uh, they were all about trust. And I think the final point I wanted to make on this in, in relation to the politics is, of course, that if these, this view that there's no trust in government, that it's really about restoring political legitimacy, is very much confirmed by Eurobarometer figures, which are quite shocking, actually. Mm. Uh, the ones we cite in our study are from last year, this year even worse. I, I, I'm afraid I've still got last year's. So overall in Europe, only 24% trust their government, 
And of our country studies, this ranged from 32% in Germany to 12% in Italy. <laughs> and for political parties, it's even worse. Overall, only 14% of people in Europe trust political parties. And the high is Germany at 15, and the low is Italy at 9, which is quite staggering, actually. Um, so, and this kind of lack of trust we found, whether you were talking about left or right, and it was fundamental sort of sense that we no longer can trust our, uh, our governments that motivated these different movements. A, a second, a, th a, a third point I wanted to make is, and this is not true for all movements, it's not true for the right-wing populist movements, but for many of the other movements, there's a preoccupation with democracy, but a huge feeling of loss of faith in representative democracy. A sense they think they represent us, but they don't, is this Spanish slogan I mentioned. Um, and this sense that democracy has to be about more than voting, that it has to be about participating, and particularly in the squares, the emphasis was on um, doing democracy themselves, what we call prefigurative action, imagining how democracy ought to be, and with quite complicated assemblies, debates, all this hand la language which you may have seen to express approval, how you conduct meetings, all of this was very, very important in the squares and was one of the reasons attracting people to the squares. And I took one quote um, from a German who was involved in one of the um, occupations. And he said it was videos of the Spanish assemblies on YouTube that motivated him to join. And he said, my heart was beating I couldn't understand a word of what they were saying, but I thought, awesome, they meet in a public square and they talk to each other. So I thought that was a kind of very nice sense of what people felt. Now, the fourth point I wanted to make is about the role of internet and Facebook. I'm going to say this rather briefly for time reasons, but um, basically... All of these demonstrations, parties, make use of social media, and social media has hugely facilitated their mobilisation, Twitter, Facebook. But what we thought was interesting was not simply the fact that, I don't know, the Spanish assemblies were started by a group of bloggers. What's really interesting is what it means for political culture, and we've put quite a lot in, this, in, in our report, and it's something we want to look at further, that if you engage through Facebook and the internet, you actually think about politics in a rather different way. And there's a lot of emphasis among the activists on things like horizontality, replaceability, leaderlessness. I'm not sure how serious all of them are. I mean, some people complained that leaderlessness actually means there are leaders that you don't know who the leaders are. But at the same time, what is very interesting is the sense people have where you can go in and do your bit and then leave it to somebody else to take over. <laughs> that you, um, We called it the 2.0 culture because the idea is that the earlier internet culture was about reading and searching and the new 2.0 culture is about editing and writing. So you can go in and participate and then somebody else can take over from you. And this idea that you can participate a bit and it doesn't matter who you are and you can be anonymous is creating something very different and more extensive than before. And I don't really know what the long-term <coughs> consequences will be. I think another aspect of that is that for all activists, which I found very interesting, internet freedom is a key issue and process is a key issue. For all of them, uh, what they're concerned about is building this new democratic process, and they're less concerned about outcomes. A lot of politi politicians criticise the activists for not having a set of demands, and they feel that misses the point, 
because the point is actually how you reach an agreement, how you reach a decision, not what that decision is. And so process and how you involve people is absolutely key, especially for the parliament. <coughs> and now the final conclusion that I want to talk about a little bit more was the one that was most disappointing for us, is that among this, these sorts of people, the sub, people who participate in subterranean politics, Europe, by and large, was invisible. What do I mean by that? Well, of course, we went out searching for Europe, and that's why we ended up calling it subterranean politics, because what <laughs> we found was that among what you might call the elite, NGOs, trades unions, intellectuals, politicians who travel around Europe, you can find dozens of appeals for a new Europe the manifesto of appalled economists, and not the road to Europe. There are so many, and we actually have a sub... If you Google subterranean politics, you'll find our website, which has a list of all these appeals. But actually, they're rather a minority, and the appeals don't seem to have any resonance in the same way that subterranean politics does. But among subterranean politics, among the people that we interviewed, Europe was simply not present. We designed questions, you know, with what level of government do you think decisions ought to be taken, which were designed to elicit a European response, and Europe never came up. And it, there were only a few exceptional cases, uh, the Greek demonstrations where things were blamed on the Troika, which was the European Central Bank, the European Commission and the IMF, uh, and the demonstration against the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. But by and large, <coughs> Europe was simply not there. When we explicitly asked people what they thought about Europe, we found differences that were both generational and geographical. So older generation of activists, by and large, were rather pro-Europe, and they saw Europe as very important in overcoming the legacy of 20th century wars, and for them it was really important. The younger generation, interestingly, including UK young people, took Europe for granted. They said, you know, we travel around Europe with students in different universities, uh, we know, use the euro, not in Britain but elsewhere, uh, we're part of the easy jet culture. <laughs> so they felt European, but for them, the European Union, by and large, was irrelevant to that feeling. It was, if, if you ask them explicitly, they saw it as a neoliberal bureaucracy. And you saw this, there was also a geographical difference. By and large, Southern Europeans and Eastern Europeans were more pro-Europe than people from France, Germany, Britain, and particularly countries which had gone through a transition to democracy tended to be more pro-Europe. Now, it's not that the activists were not internationalists. On the contrary, they were very internationalists. I mean, one of my favourite stories is, comes from the Barcelona Plaza de Catalunya, which divided itself into three bits. There was an Egyptian bit which discussed democracy. <laughs> there was an Icelandic bit which discussed the economy. <laughs> and there was a Palestinian bit that discussed Justice And on the marches, you saw no Spanish flags, but you saw Egyptian, Icelandic, and Palestinian flags. So there was, a lot of a sen there was a lot of solidarity. It wasn't that there wasn't solidarity, but there just wasn't any interest in the European Union, which was really a quite striking finding. So now, let me conclude, because I know I was... I was only meant to talk for 20 minutes. I think the first point to make is that I do think the current crisis is fundamentally a political crisis. I think the activists are right to perceive it as a political crisis, and I think it's about the collapse of the legitimacy of nation-states, which is extremely disturbing. Why do I think there has been this collapse in legitimacy? Well, I think it's two reasons. One has to do with globalisation, which is that decisions that are supposed to be taken at a national level are actually taken in Brussels, in the headquarters of multinational corporations, in New York, in Washington. 
And so, however, so the however much politicians promise to do things, they're actually confined by international agreements of various sorts. And so it's extremely difficult. You vote for a politician to change things, and actually their potential for change is increasingly limited. But I don't think that's the only reason. So however perfect your democracy is nationally, I mean, if democracy is about the ability to change the decisions that affect your life, and those decisions are not taken nationally, then it doesn't going to mean that it's democracy. But I also think we're coming to the end of a phase of history where the nation state was the dominant political form. And there's a kind of sclerosis of the nation state. It's got <coughs> stuck in certain processes and ways of being. Um, and partly that stuckness is illustrated by the intermeshing of elites, political financial media that make it very, very difficult for ordinary people to penetrate that elite. Partly it's the sort of routines of bureaucracies. And partly I think it's the technology of elections with all the emphasis on polls and focus groups. Politicians are focused on that tiny middle floating voter which means that parties are often not very distinct and it's very difficult to have a real genuine public debate about things. And that's why I do think the protesters' emphasis on process is so incredibly important, that we do need different political processes. So what does that mean? I mean, uh, if, if I'm right, where, can new, where are new sources of legitimacy for political authority to be derived from? And could the European Union offer that? Um, alternative. Well, certainly at the moment it doesn't. And I think one of the things that came out is that the old narrative that people of my generation believe in, that the EU was a peace project, <laughs> never again would there be a war in Europe, never again would Europe become imperialist, that narrative just doesn't resonate with the young. So I think what we need is to think about how could the European Union become a kind of institution that actually protects democracy at local levels from the storms of globalisation, makes it more possible for people. Because at the moment, what the European Union is doing is exactly the opposite. What the euro has done is removed the one mechanism of protection, which is exchange rates, but it hasn't offered another form of protection. And so the question is, how could it actually become a different sort of institution that does actually allow people to take control of their lives? So I'm less interested in how do you democratise Europe, though that would be good, but more what sort of institution should Europe become if we see it not as a new nation state, but as a kind of model of global, global governance, a way of dealing with globalisation so that people can take reclaim democracy. And I think if you think of it that way, then what it has to be is an institution that on the one hand taxes global bads, like financial speculation, like climate change, uh, carbon, like multinationals who escape taxes, <laughs> and on the other hand promotes global goods like uh, I don't know, renewable energy, health and education, youth employment, something of that sort, so that it's whole, the whole aim of it is not to be a bigger and better nation-state, which is what the United States is, but rather to be a layer <coughs> of political authority that could allow us to take back democracy, not only at national levels, but maybe at city levels and regional levels. So is there a way that this could be achieved? Well, of course, I'm feeling very, very doubtful. I think this gap between the elites and subterranean politics is, is very difficult to bridge, and I think we need a change in both. I think Europe needs to become more visible to activists, and activists actually do, even though I do think process is important, they do need to have, they do need to be putting forward some alternatives and some, they do need some policies. And the elites have to introduce some of the changes that could resonate with the activists. 
So not just the activists resonating with the mainstream, but the elites resonating with the activists, like a Tobin tax, for example. Well, will this happen? I, I, who knows? I mean, I'm rather doubtful, but I do think that's the way to go. <laughs>